eyes of the world were focused on this little island in the Caribbean Sea. Fidel Castro, the bearded opportunist, has betrayed his own country. For America, there is danger on the doorstep. This is a murder story. The victim, Fidel Castro, the president of Cuba. Castro never was assassinated. This time, he just tripped over a step. But more people have tried to murder the world's most famous socialist than any man alive. Governments and gunmen have been trying to get Castro for 50 long years. The time is nearly up. The men who tried to kill Castro have spent decades in the shadows. Now they've come forward to reveal their secrets. Who are these men? Heroes or villains? And what made them hate Castro enough to want him dead? On a trip to New York in 1959, even the cops fell in love with him. And he didn't just hand out Cuban cigars. He promised his own people free health and education and the dream of equality. you think people would want to copy him, not kill him. Hello, everyone. We'd like to share our trips with you. And tonight, we'll all be going to Cuba. Cuba lies just off the coast of Florida. Most, or many American political leaders still have this idea that Cuba rightfully should almost be a part of our dominion. They should do what we want them to do. And that if it weren't for Castro, uh, they probably would. So Castro has come to be seen as this nettlesome figure that we simply can't deal with, who has defied us and jeered at us uh, for almost 50 years and got away with it. <laughs> Nothing can drive a superpower up the wall faster than that. When Fidel Castro seized power in 1959, ordinary Cubans were ecstatic. He'd seen of a corrupt regime which had bled the country dry for the benefit of American business and a rich ruling elite. When a dove landed on his shoulder, it looked like divine approval. But not everyone felt blessed. Most of my family were elated when Castro took over, as were most of the Cuban people. Now, I remember I was not 10 years old when I saw on television a trial, when the first early trials of the revolution. And as the trial was going on, as they were going to process this man for an execution against a firing squad, which was later televised, there were vendors walking around in the audience selling candy and soft drinks. And I was nine years old, and I said, wow, this is not right. Like hundreds of thousands of middle-class Cubans, Enrique Encinosa's family 
fled Castro's revolution for the safety of Miami. Still they come. Nearly 200 Cuban refugees a day, five days a week. They arrive with little more than the clothes on their back. Their cash, houses, land, furniture have long since been signed over to the Cuban government. Castro's exiles are now pillars of Miami society. Their bitterness has grown with every year Castro has stayed in power. The majority of the Cuban exile community supports any kind of strategy that will overthrow Castro. If you're eliminating a head of state, you know, who is a dictator, who has been oppressing his people, I don't think, I think it's totally justified. I, you know, I myself support anybody who tries to kill Fidel Castro because I think it would do humanity uh, a favor. If the opportunity comes to harm him through violent means, I will gladly do so. I will consider it my duty. Castro's would-be assassins are ready to confess. Step forward, suspect one. Name, Enrique Ovarez. Occupation, architect. Motivation, betrayal. Fidel's student friend and one of the first to try to take his life. That's me and that's Fidel. Here, that's Fidel. And that's me, Fidel, and that's me. I realized in the years that we go together, that we stay together, that he is not a good person. He always has in his mind only one point, the total power. He don't have family, he don't have friends, he don't have nothing. I heard that people said, no, Fidel is communist, Fidel no is nothing, Fidel is fidelista, punto for him, and that's it. Avares became so disillusioned with Castro that he felt compelled to act. Liquidarlo físicamente, no hay otra solución. O si no, padecerlo, sentarte ahí a esperar. Just after the revolution, Castro could still be seen on Havana's streets, unconcerned and unprotected. Avares was going to gun him down in broad daylight con personas que fueran en, en una máquina con, con ametralladora o con pistola y en un lugar donde estuviera que no hubiera un total riesgo de, de tratar de matarlo cosa que se podía hacer al principio ya después más adelante eh, eh, ha sido imposible tú tienes que haber visto miles de películas cómo hacen eso el día que yo me lo encontré en ese lugar que estaba en las afueras de, de un restaurante que se llama Casalta, conversando ahí. Tú vienes en la máquina, para, lo matas y te vas en la máquina, tan sencillo como eso. It sounded simple, but killing a man for the first time is never simple. I don't pretend to know what goes through a man's mind in a situation like this, you know, because. I think we're all different, and uh, a man might do something today that he might not have the mentality to do six months from now, because uh, human beings are psychologically fragile. But I would say that a man who puts himself in a situation where he actually goes out on the field and actually puts himself within grasp, he should be committed to do, you know, what he set out to do. I don't think it's being, it, from my own perspective, I wouldn't see any excuse for that. You know, you, you're there, and uh, nobody hired you to do this. This is something that you volunteered to do. This is something that before you went into, you were totally aware of the circumstances. So you should be willing to take it to the last level. 
And if you don't, then you fail. It'd be very hard for a man to live with himself after that. Ofaris hesitated, and it cost him his one shot. Castro's agents were onto him, and he was thrown in jail. De lo único que me arrepiento es no haberlo matado. Aún a costa de mi vida. Le hubiera hecho tanto bien al público y hubiera salvado la vida. De tantos amigos. This was our first suspect's final confession. Two months later, Enrique Avares, who was ill with cancer, did take a life. His own. Now back to Edward R. Murrow. Just 30 days ago, Fidel Castro entered Havana to be greeted by cheering mobs as one of the greatest heroes in Cuba's history. A few hours ago, he returned to his apartment on the 23rd floor of the Havana Hilton Hotel in the center of the city. Good evening, Fidel Castro. You must have had a very busy week. How do you feel? Well, I feel, really, I feel well. Something tired. But we have to work very much, work very much. Uh, what about your personal safety? This is something you must think about, or uh, doesn't that worry you? Really, what I think is that I have no time to think in my personal safety. Is it true that you go wandering about the streets occasionally all by yourself? Yes, of course. I like to be alone most of the time. My friends don't like, and sometimes they come with me. But really, I don't like to be with personal work. Wasn't Fidelito supposed to be with us tonight? You are? Fidelito. Hello, Fidel Jr. Hi. That's a very good-looking puppy you have there. Is he yours? No, it's somebody gave it to my father for a present. But America's curiosity with Castro's revolution couldn't last. When Castro seized U.S.-owned businesses for the Cuban people, he revealed his true color, red. And in 50s America, what could be worse than a communist takeover on the doorstep? Castro is a convinced, dedicated egalitarian. He hates any system that provides a class society where one group of people uh, live much better than others. He didn't expect that the United States would sit on its hands and watch him do that. Some conflict was inevitable. Get your gun out. There. And so began America's secret war against Cuba. Covert operations fought by nameless men, sometimes on the order of presidents, never with the knowledge of the American people. Christmas 1959. The CIA gets the go-ahead for the big hit on the beard. The problem is that upright countries like the United States are not meant to murder foreign leaders. It is, after all, illegal. So the agency's great challenge is to dream up plans that can never be traced to the White House. They devise ingenious plots to destroy Castro's charisma. Seizing on the potent symbolism of his rebel beard, they plot to make it fall out. The plan is to steal into Castro's hotel and put a special powder into his boots. The trial run is successful, but at the last minute, their agents get cold feet. I am not thinking now to to cut my beer because I, I am accustomed to my beer and my beer means many things to my country. 
They plot to spray a TV station with an LSD-type drug to make Castro freak out on air. There's no shortage of LSD at the CIA, but they decide the plan is just too far out. If America's favorite astronaut, John Glenn, gets lost in space, they plan to blame Castro for zapping his module with magnetic rays. The plan fails when the rocket man lands safely back on planet Earth. Then brilliant minds are turned to murder. Castro is a keen diver, so the CIA wraps him a special gift, a poisoned diving suit. But Castro doesn't want a new suit. He's just been given one. So they try to booby trap a colorful seashell with dynamite and place it where Castro likes to dive. The CIA acquire two books on Caribbean mollusks, but they just can't find a shell big enough to do the job. Next, they rig a poison syringe inside a fountain pen, but they decide they just won't get away with scratching the beard. Most famously, they really do plot to kill Castro by doctoring his favorite cigars. Plan A is poison. Plan B, explosives. All these assassination attempts, we're not supposed to be involved in assassination attempts against foreign leaders. I, I know we have been, but uh, we, we shouldn't be. This is a mistake. It's a mistake. Over in Cuba, Castro's secret agents were just as dedicated to keeping him alive. One of the finest was Fabian Escalante. His exploits were even turned into a hit thriller on Cuban TV. As one assassination attempt after another was foiled, Escalante rose to become head of Cuban intelligence. He's retired now and has time to reflect on all the plots ever discovered by his agents. 18, La cuenta nos da uno, 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 uno y uno hasta el 2004. Nueve. Así que es importante eh, reiterar esto porque se habla de una cifra muy elevada, 634 conspiraciones y complots. Es cierto. Siete. One further adjustment makes it 638. Escalante is even calculated just how many plots fell under each United States presidency. Bajo la administración de Eisenhower se planearon 38 complots. De Kennedy fueron 42. En la época de Johnson fueron 72. De la época de Nixon Ford fueron 184. Escalante was keen to substantiate each and every one of the plots he's counted. He had eyes everywhere and men on the inside of the conspiracies that threatened Castro's revolution. In Havana itself, you couldn't light a cigar without him knowing. There was a grenade attack planned at a baseball game. Snipers zeroed in on the university steps 
He knew their plans down to the last detail. It was a radio-controlled plane packed with explosives to be launched from the National Library. Assassins tried to serve Castro a poisoned milkshake at Havana Hilton. They planned to ambush the presidential convoy on its way to the airport. But Fabian and his spies stopped all of them. For many years, there was one hated adversary who, for Fabian Escalante, stood above anyone else. He considered him the greatest threat to Fidel Castro. In real life, Escalante never did get his man. Step forward, suspect number two, Antonio Vecchiano. Qualified in accountancy, recruited by the CIA. Now, gone fishing just off Miami Beach. It's a sport that has to have patience. Because sometimes you can spend three hours and you can't catch any fish. It depends. Fabian Escalante was the first to be in the the former CIA man, who once ran guns to Cuba, now runs nothing more than a chain of marine stores in Miami. This is my grandson. This is my grandson. My grandson. This is my son, the president of the corporation. We have four stores. Uh, we, we sell all the items that needs uh, people for a, a boat. Uh, for example, this is, this is a gun to use in, in case of they are in danger. Inflatables, the people, for example, they can enjoy this. He is like a soccer player with cold blood shooting a penalty shot. I mean, he can stand there and he won't budge, and he will do whatever it, what he thinks is, is right. He's a very determined man. Yes, he sure is. I'm very proud of being his son, actually. <laughs> Mira, yo tengo casi la misma edad que Castro. Castro tiene dos años y un mes más que yo. Entonces, yo conocí a Castro en la universidad. Eh, algunas personas que lo conocíamos, que estábamos en la misma generación y en la universidad, teníamos alguna duda sobre las verdaderas intenciones de él. Él nunca dijo que era comunista en la sierra. Eh, empezamos los profesionales, los abogados, arquitectos y contadores, a reunirnos y decir, ¿a dónde lleva este hombre al país? Habló de elecciones, ya no quiere hacer elecciones. Y entonces nos decidimos por tratar de matar al, al tirano Castro, que creíamos que con la muerte de él podría terminarse aquel régimen. Este es el edificio de cuyo apartamento 8A, es decir, en el piso 8, el grupo, el comando de Antonio Veciana, pretendía disparar una bazuca contra esta tribuna. pero daba de frente al palacio presidencial. De allí eh, se podía ver casi la cara de, de Castro. The bazooka was ready to fire. Castro was a sitting duck. This time, his spies knew nothing. Y allí dejamos acuartelado a a, a, a las cuatro personas que iban a hacer el atentado, pero eh, de acuerdo a la explicación que dio el jefe del grupo, le, era imposible sacar la bazuca y hacer el atentado. Nadie suicida, yo no soy un suicida. Yo no quiero morir. Tengo familia, tengo hijos que atender. Tengo, quiero tener una posibilidad de vivir. Thank you. 
Stung by failure, the CIA gambled on an astonishing new partner in crime, the Mafia. Before the revolution, organized crime ran Havana, and they made millions. Castro ruined their party and threw them out. So they had a motive, and they had the means. Murder being all in a day's work for a mobster. The agency had to keep their distance from the mob. Step forward suspect number three, the go-between. Bob Mayhew, ex-FBI, a man with the Mafia's number. The Mafia had a plausible reason for wanting to get back in Cuba, which gives the United States government a possibility of denying it, whatever happens. You know, there are those who will disbelieve what I'm about to say, but my immediate problem was that uh, uh, I happen to be a Roman Catholic. As I say, I don't profess to be the Pope. I don't profess that I have a free trip to heaven, but I'm a reasonably good Catholic and believe in it. I'm Jesuit trained, and uh, I had a morality problem with the, uh, the murder of a of any person, which included, of course, the, a leader of a foreign country. Uh, uh, I remember very, very vividly what I did. I mean, I went down to my uh, recreation room. I put on some Strauss at a very low sound, and I just sat there, and I tried to experience what would happen if something went wrong. But... Uh, I was asked to do it by my government. And that, I guess, was the prevailing thing. I mean, I figured, well, who the hell am I to worry about me? You have to understand that espionage is a very dirty business. It's a dirty business. If this was the way to save one American life, it was a good way to go. Bob Mayhew meets mafia bosses to hammer out the details. The CIA want the mob to march up to Castro and just mow him down. But even gangsters aren't that crazy. So it's the Mafia who come up with an alternative, poison pills. Agency scientists decide deadly botulinum is a perfect poison for the beard. The plastic, just a little bitty capsule, very small. You could not taste it, you could not smell it. If that pill was dropped in, in liquid, hot or cold, they would instantaneously dissolve and leave no after effect as to smell or taste or anything. Having invented a lethal pill, the CIA now has to get Castro to swallow it. Someone has to get close to him. This hideaway at the Hilton Hotel is heavily guarded. But maybe the beard does have a weakness after all. This city is always noisy, loquacious and smiling. And so it sometimes appears a little frivolous and carefree, like a pretty girl. But that is only at first glance. It's a city that can show Spartan courage. And the pretty girls, it seems, aren't really so frivolous at all. Castro's divorced and has been having an affair with a young German girl. Marita Lorenz had loved Castro and his revolution. But their relationship has gone sour. The CIA persuades her to try and kill her ex-lover. She hasn't seen Castro for months, but she's kept her old room key and steals into his suite with the poison pills hidden in a jar of face cream. As Marita 
told me the story. <laughs> the first time I heard it was from her. She had put the pills in her cold cream jar. And uh, so when she went to get them out, they had somehow melted. And so she felt, okay, it won't work, and forget it. Castro uh, had asked her when she came back if she'd come back to kill him. And she said, yes, Fidel, she had. What I remember is that she began to cry at the beginning, and that in several minutes she could not tell any word to me. And so he handed her his pistol. He was stretched out on the bed, fully clothed in his dungarees, and handed her the pistol and said, well, then do it. And she said she held the pistol, pointed at him for a minute, and then she put it down and said, I can't, Fidel. And he said, of course you can't. No one can. <laughs> Now desperate to dislodge Castro, the CIA hatched its most brazen scheme. It all began here. On President Eisenhower's order, they planned not only to kill Castro, but mount an invasion of Cuba. In 1960, Miami Zoo was a secret training camp. The world could never know that the American government was turning thousands of Cuban exiles into a fighting force capable of deposing Castro's regime. When they landed on Cuban soil at the Bay of Pigs, it was meant to look like they planned the invasion all by themselves. Howard Hunt was one of the CIA's top men. We were heavily involved in the recruitment and uh, the infiltration of the, the uh, people that we, rec we recruited wanted to go in by parachute or, or by sea and get rid of the devil, uh, Mr. Castro. Castro was such a charismatic leader that there was just no possible antidote to him that would not have meant uh, uh, U.S. overt involvement. And that, of course, was what the United States government wanted to avoid. And, of course, Eisenhower uh, wanted the American hand totally concealed. And I think the agency learned a, a big lesson from that, that you can't uh, do both. You can't succeed, and you can't keep the American hand uh, invisible. Was part of the plan to kill Fidel Castro... To do what? To kill Fidel Castro. Well, those are not, that word kill, the verb kill, is not easily used in uh, government communications. Uh, I myself felt that that was the uh, ultimate solution, because if you had him, you had a caged tiger. And, uh, uh, but we never got that far. These are anxious days for Cuba. The threat of armed aggression hangs over the little island. At any minute, the order may be given from there, and hordes of mercenaries, trained by the imperialists, will move on the island. The big day came in April 1961. Castro crushed the invasion in hours. Despite their efforts, the role of America was plain for all to see. The plan had been hatched by Eisenhower, but it was executed by Kennedy. For America's idealistic young president, it was all very embarrassing. But even that didn't deter JFK. He kept on pushing the CIA to get rid of Castro. Until, in an irony lost on many, he got assassinated himself. Fidel Castro and his right-hand man Che Guevara might have thought they would finally be left in peace, free to cut cane and build the Cuban socialist dream, without having to worry quite so much about being assassinated the whole time. 
Pache, the revolutionary pinup, was soon off around Latin America, preaching communism Cuban style, until his luck ran out. Step forward suspect number four, Felix Rodriguez. A born fighter, he fled Cuba and signed up as a CIA sniper. One thing made him a big hit with America's first family. He tried to kill Fidel three times. President Bush, my father. Uh, that was when he was vice president at the White House. To Felix Rodriguez with high esteem and admiration, George Bush. Here's from President Bush, and this time, this is uh, Bush's brother, Jeb, now governor of Florida. And is that um, another photo of you and President Bush behind Yes. There? We were talking at the time about the Che Guevara story, so I told them, you know, the last moment of Che Guevara, and then everybody that I go to, uh, it's always very interesting knowing the character of Che Guevara, what did he had to say at the last minute, and you know what was the conversation between the two of us. So we did talk about, a lot about that. This is the one with Che Guevara in Bolivia. Are you in that photo, Felix? Yeah, this is me right here. And that's Che here. And that's actually the last picture of Che alive. There seems absolutely no doubt at all that this is Che Guevara. Uh, look, yes, they're now sitting Che Guevara up, actually sitting him up. Uh, his dead body is now being sat up. It's the most fantastic sight. He's a very pale, ghastly, ghostly yellow color. Uh, his head has rolled back onto the stretcher on which he was brought in. His eyes are still open. Balls of his eyes sticking out at you. And now they're lifting his head up by his neck. Rodriguez personally gave the order to execute Che Guevara. I said, is anything I can say to your family? And then he changed and said, then, if you can't tell my wife to remarry and try to be happy. And those were his last word. Then he came to me, he approached me, and he shook my hand, I shook his hand, he embraced me, I embraced him. And then he stood back in attention, thinking I was going to be the one to shoot him. So I left the room. And there was a Sergeant Tehran who was taking care of those matters and told him his order from your command to eliminate the prisoner. Don't shoot him from here up, shoot from here down, because this man is supposed to die from combat wound. We say, see me, Capitan, see me, Capitan. So I left the room, I went to an advanced post that I had, and I was taking note. It was one o'clock when I left the room there, Bolivian time, about 1.10, that's when we heard the burst. The CIA's achievement was to make Che Guevara a martyr for his cause, celebrated by millions to this day. By the late 60s, Castro was not only still alive, he was thriving, still popular, and managing Cuban socialism virtually single-handed. Castro insists on becoming an expert in every agricultural science. At this cattle insemination ranch, he personally instructs a man on how to test a bull. I pay a great deal of attention to agriculture. And in order to be able to direct activity in agriculture, I've had to bring together much information about it. And that information can only be got by going out into the countryside. At home, Castro's spies kept him safe. Whenever he left the country, he was a much easier target. In 1971, the CIA teamed up once more with the accountant Antonio Vesciano. They planned to kill Castro on a visit to Chile. My father was stationed at the United States Embassy in La Paz, Bolivia, and uh, we decided to go on a vacation. The journey to adventure is so simple now. We went from La Paz, Bolivia, in through the Lake Titicaca, which is the highest lake in the world, and then we went and we traveled all the way to Santiago, Chile. And uh, during th that trip that I thought was a vacation, 
my father did just something that was phenomenal. I'm sure that my mom knew, because my father didn't keep anything away from my mom. And a friend that came with us that I later found out was the fellow who was supposed to have done the shooting. Antonio Vesciano devises a new way to kill Castro. Conceal a gun inside a film camera and obtain fake press passes for his two gunmen. El Servicio de Seguridad Cubano a toda la prensa le, le pedía la cámara y la revisaba. Pero no, 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 alguien que sabía no, nos dijo cómo se podía hacer sin que ellos lo descubrieran. La idea era en una conferencia de prensa abalanzarse sobre Castro y matarlo. Eran dos personas dispuestas a los mayores sacrificios de vida y los preparé. His intelligence is spot on. Castro arrives to face the press. Vesciana thinks his men are right there, just feet away from the beard, guns loaded. It was a specific day, he was just sitting there and he kept pacing back and forth in front of the phone. So I nonchalant just walked up to him and said, Dad, what's the matter? He goes, no, no, son, I'm just waiting for uh, an important phone call. What was really interesting was that my father was very upset when he got that phone call. And I've never seen him that, that upset and stuff. And I didn't know that obviously it's because the guy canceled the, uh, the assassination attempt. Fallaron porque, en mi opinión, porque el valor final le, falló, le faltó. Empezaron a buscar excusas diciendo que era muy difícil eh, hacer el trabajo y se fueron. I later found out that he said something that he got an appendicitis. I, I don't believe that. I think he got a little scared under the hood, you know, and stuff. I, I, I told something to my dad now that things are falling. So I told my dad, you should have hired an Arab. Those guys are not scared of anything. They're willing to give their life away if they have to. In the 1970s, events took a darker turn. Frustrated by their failure to eliminate Castro, hardliners sought new targets for their venom. They turned on their own community ruthlessly silencing Miami Cubans who dared to talk of peace. There were efforts against the lives of people, Cubans especially, who thought it was time to begin a dialogue with Cuba. The hardliners didn't like that, and so the reaction was to try to blow them up or shoot them. And I suppose you can say, no wonder. Given that uh, these hardline exiles had been trained by the CIA, they had been involved in sabotage raids against Cuba, uh, some of them in assassination attempts and so forth, this was the way they operated. Step forward suspect number five, Dr. Orlando Bosch. A reckless hardliner who hated Castro so much, he abandoned his career in pediatric medicine for terrorism. He's linked to at least 50 bombings. In 1967, he fired a bazooka at a ship in Miami Harbor simply because it was on its way to Havana. He even threatened the British Prime Minister because he was too soft on Cuba. One woman's followed his tracks, writer and journalist Anne Barda. Orlando Bosch is a convicted terrorist. If for nothing else, the shooting here in the Miami Harbor of the Polish ship which he admits to. But he also talks about dozens and dozens of other militant strikes and his lifetime quest to kill Fidel Castro. What happened next will never be forgotten or forgiven by Cuban people. In October 1976, Orlando Bosch became Cuba's most wanted man. Well, there were 73 passengers on the plane. 
it picked up passengers in Guyana, then it stopped in Barbados and it had to refuel. And then apparently at that time, two of the men boarded the plane. They went into the, um, the toilets of the plane and um, put the plant of the bombs in there, in the plane. And as soon as the, um, the, the, the plane, the jet took off, I think it was, um, what, 11 minutes or something, 11 six, seconds? Six, six minutes. Six I minutes I later, I mean, a few minutes later, it just blew up over the Barbadian Ocean. the time we had a cousin she woke us up and she kept saying to all of us sit down you need to sit down I remember her saying to my mother you know please sit down sit down and she said the plane that Raymond was on I remember she kept saying I think I think the plane that Raymond was on went down and my mother screamed because we can assume what happens next, that there will be no survivors. The wreckage fell near Barbados. There were no survivors. There had been 73 passengers and crew on board. Amongst them, the 24 members of the Cuban national fencing team. Many were teenagers. Two men were convicted in Venezuela of placing the bombs. But the suspected masterminds remained elusive. CIA documents reveal that days before the bombing, an associate of Orlando boss was overheard saying, we're going to hit a Cuban airplane. Orlando has the details. Boss was detained for the crime in Venezuela, but was never convicted. In 1989, Boss emerged back in the United States. He was arrested, but only for a parole violation. The anti-Castro cause meant votes, and Miami Republicans campaigned for his freedom. He became the cornerstone of the campaign by Ileana Ross Leighton for her run for the U.S. Congress. The campaign became for Orlando Bosch. Her campaign manager, was a young, ambitious politician named Jeb Bush. And Jeb Bush's father was uh, the vice president of the United States and then was the president of the United States. Mr. President, it is an honor and a thrill that you have come to Miami on behalf of my campaign. I'm extremely grateful for all of your support and encouragement in the past weeks. And despite protests from the U.S. Justice Department, particularly from Bush's own attorney general, saying that this is one of the worst terrorists operating in our hemisphere, that we, under no circumstances, should allow him to remain here, President George Bush overruled them all at the request of his son and granted residency to Orlando Bosch. He has spent the past 13 years in Venezuelan and American prisons. Bosch's relatives say he is in poor health and just wants to spend time with his family. The Justice Department has tried to deport Bosch as a terrorist, but 31 countries refuse to take him. Orlando Bosch settled down with his family in Miami. He's a keen landscape painter who depicts Cuban scenes remembered from his youth. Es que puedo pedirle cuál es uh, cuál es su pintura favorita. Sí, esa de ella. 77. 
Cuando era preso. Sí. sí. Sácala. Sácala. Ya, Karen. Claro. <risa> Muy cansado, ¿no? Mira, ¿eh? Dile que no se parece chinito a ese. ¿Eh? ¿Chinito? Muy grande. <risa> Quiere mucho. ¿no? Sí, Orlando Hoch, el hombre que yo conocí. Orlando Hoch, el bueno. Orlando Hoch, digo mal. ¿Por qué Castro... Lo menciona usted tantas veces. Cada vez que tiene que acusar a alguien, sí. doctor Orlando Bosch. Lo que soy es que más daño lo ha hecho. Es que de verdad, es, 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 nosotros, yo... ¿Por qué es que Castro le tiene miedo? Bueno, me tiene, me tiene, me tiene sentenciado tres veces pero a condena a muerte. Doctor, una pregunta. Usted ahorita se refería al... Atentado al avión en Barbados. ¿Usted tuvo que ver con eso? ¿Con el avión? No, yo tengo que decirte que no. Está bien. Y no es solo ese. El avión de Jamaica. Que por todo el... Y el avión aquí de los paquetes. Que llevaba los paquetes de Cuba. Que lo volaron también. Entonces, a mí me acusan de estos aviones. Pero usted abrió una de Castro, a mí me cosa. Yo lo dejo. No digo que no, ni que sí. En una guerra, este país y todo el mundo, en una guerra, usted tiene que derribar los aviones del enemigo, usted tiene que, que de, de, de destruir los rumalinos del enemigo, todo lo que usted pueda. Porque es así, los, yo lo no considero que nosotros estamos en guerra con, con Castro. Y, 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 y en la guerra. This really upset a lot of people because it turned out that most of the people on this plane were civilians. There really is no evidence that these were very, very important uh, high-level Cuban officials on the, on the plane, or military officials, etc. Nos inclinamos decididamente por la primera tesis. La CIA tuvo una participación directa en la destrucción del avión de Cubana en Barbados. El reclutamiento de ciudadanos y el empleo del territorio de otros países para realizar actos de esa naturaleza son métodos típicos de la CIA. Castro plays David to our Goliath beautifully and we give him an opportunity almost on a weekly basis. Uh, we do something which allows him to put the blame on us. We're unable to deal rationally with Cuba. After the plane bomb, America and Cuba did, for once, get talking. In 79, President Jimmy Carter even invited Castro to visit the States. The last time Fidel Castro made this journey, it was shortly after the revolution that brought him to power. Nothing that's happened since has made the visit less of a security risk for him, and on the plane coming over, he was asked if he was wearing a bulletproof vest. One track, one suit. Everybody says you always have a bulletproof vest. Everybody says that you always have a bulletproof vest. No. No. Uh, <laughs> but there was a plot to kill Castro just after he touched down on American soil. I have a moral one. A moral vest. A moral vest. Tomorrow, when he makes his speech, the United Nations itself will allow no visitors. And instead of the usual sequence of national leaders coming to the podium, Fidel Castro will have the session all to himself. A sensible precaution, since last time he was here, in 1960, he went on for four hours and 29 minutes. The hatred still burned in one of Castro's oldest enemies. Antonio Vesciana 
plotted to hide plastic explosives inside a softball and throw it at Castro's car. Sino que tenía que ser una bomba de contacto. Cuando eso se lanzara, al tocar el carro explotaba. Y eso es una cosa de mucho riesgo y tiene que saber muy bien, tiene que ser un experto. Y el señor Edel Montiel había sido preparado por la CIA en explosivo y sabía perfectamente lo que podía hacer. But Fabian Escalante's undercover agents were already on the case. Teníamos un dispositivo en ese momento. Habían personas cerca de Antonio Veciana. Y bueno, finalmente le suministramos al FBI la información. Mire, el día tal, a tal hora, se planea este atentado contra el compañero Fidel y pudimos desarticularlo. Es decir, fue un año muy interesante, fueron años muy interesantes. Y yo creo que en ese combate eh, nosotros salimos victoriosos. Y es que usted era terrorista. En aquel tiempo sí. En aquel tiempo. Pero desde hace mucho tiempo que dejé de terrorista. A ver. Es decir, sacrifiqué a mí. El mérito no era mío. El mérito era de mi esposa y de mis hijos, que me veían de tarde en tarde. Y cuando uno tiene la victoria, todavía hay una recompensa. Pero aquí no hubo recompensa. There was another man accused of the Cuban airline bombing in 1976, though he denies it. Step forward, suspect number six, Luis Posada Carriles. His life's ambition to kill the communist Castro. In the 50s, Havana University trained Posada in chemistry and engineering. In the 60s, America trained him in sabotage and explosives. Writer and Bardak met him when he was on the run. Posada came out, an elderly man, kind of silver gray hair, real gentleman, took my bags. He had a van waiting outside. He had the gravelly crushed voice. A lot of charm, a lot of self-confidence. Big, big ladies man. He gets involved from Bay of Pigs. Bay of Pigs is the jumping off point for Luis Posada. Uh, and he had a lot of advantages because he had previously uh, worked as an exterminator. That was the first career of Luis Posada. Something that I find curious about Luis Posada is he did his degrees in chemical engineering. So he was the one with the real background in explosives. During his many years behind bars, he discovered a talent for acrylics. Posada's paintings sell like hot cakes in Miami and the proceeds fund his struggle against Castro. His friend, Enrique Encinosa and his wife, help out with the sales. What I love about this is you can see the little moss growing from the walls, and again, the shadows coming off from the insides of the castle. Luis is very good at shadows. This painting is of a uh, street in Oriente province, and to me, it's one of the best works done by Luis Posada Carrera. If you will observe, he has excellent depth in the street, tremendous use of shadows. You know, I think you're dealing here with a sensitive man, and I know it might be hard for some people in your audience to understand that a, that a guy who spent all his life doing war and that has been accused of almost everything by one government or the other and who has lived in hiding for so many years would be sensitive. But he... In 1997, seven bombs tore apart Havana's hotels. The aim? To warn European tourists away from Cuba and bring Castro's economy to its knees. 
one young Italian traveller named Fabian de Salmo was killed in the blasts. Cuba's security men did catch the bomber, but it was clear he wasn't the man in charge. A year later, Posada spoke to the press and couldn't help letting slip that he was the mastermind. Another thing that goes on the charge sheet is the bombings in Havana in 1997. Okay, since, uh, um, okay. The fact of it is, is that it has never been proven he did it. He has never been indicted for it. So from a strictly legal viewpoint, uh, I personally think it's an acceptable method. It's a way of damaging the tourist economy. The message that one tries to get across is that Cuba was not a healthy place for tourists. So uh, if Cuba is not a healthy place for tourists because there's a few windows being blown out of hotels, that's fine. It's the year 2000. Cuban agents are in Panama to protect Castro on a visit. Under close surveillance is a group of Castro's oldest adversaries. Luis Posada was there with Gaspar Jimenez, Pedro Ramon, and Guillermo Novo, and they were there to try to assassinate Fidel Castro. There can be no doubt about that. They also had been infiltrated, probably by one of their own, probably by one of their confidants, and Cuban intelligence certainly knew what they were up to. They are exceptionally good. Acuérdense que yo soy un profesional, y cuando yo vi las imágenes por la televisión, del trabajo que habían hecho mis compañeros, eh, me quedé maravillado. Eh, qué excelente trabajo. Es decir, eh, es una obra de arte, es un trabajo muy bien hecho. The plot, the 638th and last in Escalante's list, was to take Castro out with a bang by putting a huge bomb underneath his podium. When it was foiled, Castro reveled in the victory. La extrema derecha de ese país han sido enviados a Panamá con el propósito de eliminarme físicamente. Ya se encuentran en esta ciudad y han introducido armas y explosivos. Una copia del caballero. Prosecutors amassed a compelling case against Posada. Finally, in April 2004, Panama's Supreme Court sentenced him and his associates to prison. But four months later, he was out again. Mysteriously, Posada received a pardon from Panama's outgoing president. A year later, in 2005, Luis Posada slipped undetected into Miami itself. For months, he lived a normal life. The authorities let him be. Posada was so relaxed, he even held a press conference to tell his side of the plane bomb story. He slurs his words a little because he was shot in the mouth while he was on the run. Ese abominable hecho. Como un caso de, de terrorismo, que ha sido usado por Castro a través de todos esos años para tratar de, de mentir, mezclarme. Mi único objetivo es luchar por la liberación de mi padre. I was shocked, sure. I mean, shock, yeah. Yeah, that here he's now hanging out in Miami asking for political asylum. Shock, yeah, it's just like a terrorist. George Bush says that anyone who gives refuge or shelters a terrorist is a terrorist. Well, then that makes George Bush himself a terrorist. 
he certainly is sheltering at this point Luis Posada Cariles and his father allowed Orlando Bosch a safe conduct so that he could remain and live in Miami. If anybody harbors a terrorist, they're a terrorist. If they fund a terrorist, they're a terrorist. If they house terrorists, they're terrorists. I mean, I can't make it any more clearly to other nations around the world. And that's what they are. I mean, Orlando Bosch and Luis Posada Cadiles are terrorists. I mean, no other definition fits. All this might not matter too much if all Miami's assorted terrorists and assassins were in retirement, but they aren't. We went to see a man who got arrested for possessing a Stinger missile he wanted to use to kill Fidel Castro. Step forward our final suspect, Rodolfo Frometa, electrician and guerrilla. Orlando Moreno, jefe de relaciones internacionales. Aquí tenemos el teniente Monzón. Aquí tenemos el comandante de, eh, que es, jefe, es segundo jefe de seguridad de Comando F4. Aquí tenemos el segundo jefe de Relaciones Internacionales de, de Comando F4. Este es el hermano aquí del presidente, eh, Jim Bush, gobernador del, del estado de la Florida, el cual es mi amigo. Tenemos muy buenas relaciones. Este es Luis Manuel Frometa, el niño que me mató Fidel Castro con solamente 19 años de edad. Pero tú quisieras que eliminara, pues dile si tú quisieras que eliminara a Fidel Castro o no. Es un viejo, perdonando la frase, como decimos en Cuba, bien jodedor. Entonces, como él es tan jodedor, pues hay que fregarle la vida y joderlo a él. Así que nosotros no entendemos que ya porque él esté viejo, él sigue siendo el mismo viejo asesino que cuando era un joven asesino. Fermesa and his men live out their dream most weekends in the Everglades. They still believe they can get Castro. The plan for Cuba's transition from Stalinist rule to a free and open society to identify ways to hasten the arrival of that day. No matter what the dictator intends or plans, Cuba será pronte libre. Stay in the way, ball. Cuba libre. Thank you all. Cuba seems to have the same effect on American administrations that the full moon once had on werewolves. You know, we. May, may not sprout hair and howl, but we behave in the, in the same way, just irrationally. Whatever became of Luis Posada Carriles, the United States could have sent him to join other suspected terrorists in Guantanamo Bay, but they didn't. Posada was very publicly arrested and escorted under armed guard. But he wasn't charged with blowing up planes or trying to murder Fidel Castro. He was simply detained for visa irregularities. ¿Por qué está detenido Luis Posada Carriles? Bueno, está detenido simplemente por entrar a ilegal Estados Unidos. Nadie ha dicho que Luis Posada Carriles es el Bin Laden latinoamericano, en lo absoluto. Es decir, todo lo que se dice de Posada Carriles es que es un anticastrista. No, señor. Posada Carril y Orlando Bush no son anticastristas, son terroristas, que son dos cosas distintas. 
The American authorities wouldn't let us visit Posada in jail. But his friends chat to him almost daily. Hey there. Hey. Hello. Hello. Okay. Come on in. Thank you very much. Come right in. How are you doing? Fine. Good, Fine. good. Make yourselves at home. And uh, how's Luis? Luis is fine, expecting your call. Okay. Um, where have his paintings gone? We had a painting exhibition, and we sold 121 paintings. It was very, very successful. And it was like over $30,000 in, uh, in paintings sold in, in, over the weekend. Buenos dias, campeón. Posada was on good form. But he was perplexed that the American government, which he'd served so long, had, if only for a little while, put him behind bars. I was very happy to hear him. Yeah, he, he's kind of grown on us. Yeah, he, he's quite a character. We're looking forward to having him back, hopefully soon. <laughs> hopefully soon. It would be a shame if he dies in jail. But like he tried to say, I mean, the struggle is going to continue with him or without him. So, because it's a just struggle, we're looking to do something that is important to, what, 12 million people now? So... Six hundred and thirty eight plots to kill Castro and a few close shaves. Now it looks like the beard can die a natural death. Castro is probably, of all the heads of government, the one with the tightest security. When he flies, he uses three airplanes, and you don't know which one he's riding in. When he goes to a foreign country uh, to visit, he carries everything, so nobody will try to poison his drinks. He takes his own food, his own water, his own ice. He has a number of doubles, one of which is uh, his older brother, Ramon, who looks very much like him. And they even have a wax dummy in Cuba. They sit in a car and drive around town. He has at least 50 or 60 houses that he resides in and changes them constantly. You know, and a Praetorian Guard of several hundred. With such tight security, it's very, very difficult to carry out a successful operation against them. But again, we only have to be successful once. But you haven't been. It's all right. You know, we only have to be successful once. <laughs> <laughs> 